Hey everyone, welcome to this week's Azure Infrastructure Update. It's the 1st of September and a nice little selection of updates this week. As always, we have the chapters, so you can jump to any update that is of most interest. New videos this week, I dived into the new API-driven provisioning capability of Entra, formerly known as Azure AD. What this enables me to do is before there was the ability to drive provisioning to Azure AD, Entra, or Active Directory domain services if I was a Workday or success factors. Well, now with this API that just accepts a skim payload via this endpoint, I can provision from anything. So I go through that, and then of course I can take advantage of dynamic groups and lifecycle workflows, all of those other things to complete the user's journey. And then finding gaps in conditional access. If we think of conditional access is really that boundary protecting the authorizations against our tenant, what if I've missed something? So there's some nice workbooks and just overview blades I can go and look at to help me find out where maybe there's a gap in my most commonly used applications to help me close that up. On to what's new. So on the compute side, trusted launch virtual machines are now the default via the portal. So what this means now is, hey, if I just go and create a virtual machine, what we'll see is the default, as you can see right here, is now this option of a trusted launch virtual machine and I could go in and configure the various security features of it. And what the trusted launch virtual machine is, it's something you want to do. It's gonna use the Gen 2, i.e. UEFI-based virtual machine. So the big deal there is with the UEFI-based, it gives me things like a virtual TPM. With that virtual TPM and the UEFI, I can have things like Secure Boot. So I get protection against root kits, against boot kits. I get measured boot. So an attestation all the way from the UEFI into the booted operating system that nothing has messed with that. It's measured. I get boot integrity monitoring. Now there obviously are different images. You'll see, hey, look, it's a Gen 2 image because it's UEFI versus the Gen 1, which is BIOS based. So I do need a specific type of Gen 2 image to match the generation of the VM. But basically what they're doing is they're, they're pushing us in that direction because, hey, it's, it's the better option. We want to have that security. And so that's now going to be the default. Moving on. So app configuration now has snapshots in preview. Remember app configuration is that centralized store where I can have those key values that drive the configuration of all of my applications. So the snapshots is just this immutable point in time copy of those values based on filters I can define. And if I think about why would I want that, imagine a rollback scenario. Hey, I'm making some changes, or oh, something doesn't go well, I could create a snapshot before I make the changes so I can roll back to that immutable configuration, which I know is good. I could, because it's immutable, know, hey, if there has been change been made, I might use it for change history, for auditing, to help me do versioning. So that's a really nice capability for that centralized configuration. Um, ASR, so that Azure Site Recovery, has a higher churn support. So if you think of Azure Site Recovery, it helps us replicate those virtual machines to another zone, to another region. Well, the higher churn is both at the VM level and a per disk level. So the VM, they've increased up to 100 megabytes per second and churn is change. So how much is the disk changing? But also the per disk limit has increased up to 50 megabytes per second if I think it's a P30 or above. So if we go and look at the documentation, it will tell us, and it talks about, hey, high churn support and Hey, it, it talks about, yes, that P30 and above, I can see it's now up to 50 megabytes per second. And it also talks about, hey, the VM itself is 100 megabytes per second. And so that's gonna be super useful where I have those scenarios of maybe it's running a database. So I do get that very high rate of change on my disk. Well, now I can still protect it with Azure Site Recovery. 
uh, AKS now has the auto upgrade, which is super powerful. Remember the auto upgrade. Now you need to use it in the right way. I wanna make sure I auto upgrade my dev test, make sure I've tested my app before I go and apply it to production. Well, this is actually gonna help me do some of that. So now I have scheduled maintenance. So those auto upgrades will only happen within the window I define. So it's gonna help me minimize impact to my production workflows, although, the upgrades typically is gonna cordon off some nodes, drain them, upgrade those who do a rolling upgrade anyway, but still, if it's in the middle of production, I probably don't wanna do upgrades of that nature. So now I can schedule that maintenance via a window that I define, and outside of that window, it won't make any changes. Azure Functions that are ASP.NET Core now have some integration improvements with that .NET Core. And really what this boils down to, if I'm working with, for example, HTTP triggers in those isolated functions, remember isolated means I can run a version of .NET different from the underlying host, well now I can use things like ASP.NET HTTP requests, uh, HTTP responses, I action results. It's just gonna let me leverage my existing knowledge of ASP.NET Core better within my Azure Function projects and they've also made some improvements to a cold start. So this is the idea that maybe I've got a certain application that's very sensitive to the cold start. Hey, it's just launching up and I have to wait before I can start interacting with it. So that initialization that generally slows me down, they've introduced certain concepts like placeholders, they've optimized the executor. I can even do ready to run binaries where I do an ahead of time compilation all of which means when I have that cold start condition, the function will be available that much faster to process those workloads coming in. And I now have .NET 8 in my Linux. So if I'm using those Linux Elastic Premium and dedicated, I can get .NET 8. And the Azure uh, container apps now have the dedicated plan in GA. So the whole point of the dedicated plan is I can create this idea of a workload profile environment. And what the workload profile environment can let me do is, well, I can have general purpose, I can have things like memory optimized, and it gives me more granular control with the dedicated plan of my minimum scale, my maximum scale. Now I can sk still scale down to zero, so I can scale all the way down to, hey, I'm not paying anything, but now I do have more control of maybe how I'm spending that, because it's in this dedicated plan and this particular workload profile, I can control things like, hey, the outbound path that it's gonna take, I can have better isolation. So it just gives me um, some overall better control. I still have the regular consumption plan if I wanna use that, but now we have this dedicated plan as well. And there are actually a whole bunch of other updates to the Azure Container Apps. So they support, for the, in GA, it supports UDR, so user-defined routes, NAT gateway to, again, help control that outbound flow. I can have smaller subnets when I'm using those workload profiles. The jobs capability went GA. Remember, ordinarily, we have this workload just running in a, a longer duration. A job runs until it completes. So this can be really useful based on some mutual execution, a scheduled execution, a trigger-based execution that performs some task. Maybe it's a migration, maybe it's whatever I need to just run, but then it will stop once it finishes that task. And in preview, they had the ability to have additional TCP ports beyond just the primary HTTP or TCP port if I need to support multiple ports, and also mutual TLS encryption if I need that end-to-end -end capability. And then finally, lots of things here. So Virtual Machine Insights, remember that curated set of information, and logs that it captures and guidance it gives is now GA with the Azure Monitor Agent. So the Azure Monitor Agent, remember, replaced the old log analytics agent, the diagnostics extension if you were Linux Telegraph. This works with great things like data collection rules which enable me to centralize, manage what I want to capture. So now it is GA for use with Virtual Machine Insights. On to networking. So Azure Firewall can now auto-learn snap routes. So what this is basically gonna do is I need to have Azure Route Server, and I'm telling Azure Firewall, go and talk to this Azure Route Server. So remember, Azure Route Server can go and learn via B 
BGP sessions with SD-WAN appliances, other sets of private IP addresses that I want excluded from SNAT. So every 30 minutes, it will go and talk to my Azure Route server and find out those private ranges that it knows it shouldn't SNAT, so that's in preview. Also, Azure Firewall Explicit Proxy is now in preview. So what this enables me to do is the private IP of the Azure Firewall, once I turn on this explicit proxy, I can specify that internal IP of the firewall in applications, in my web browser, to say this is the proxy I want you to use. I want all of your outbound flow to go to the private IP of the Azure Firewall that can then apply its rules and then all of that outbound control. Um, also, Azure Firewall is now GA in Poland Central, and there's now a single click SKU change. So this is both from standard to premium and premium to standard. So I can now easily switch those with zero downtime. On the database side, so now I have the database migration service from the portal in preview. Now, I can still use obviously the extension in Azure Data Studio. I can still use it from CLI, from PowerShell. But now from the portal, I can go and create that database migration service and I can start a SQL migration from SQL on-premises to uh, an Azure SQL managed instance, offline or online, to just an Azure SQL virtual machine to Azure SQL database. And that's offline only if it's Azure SQL database. I get this nice integration runtime configuration page if I need a self-hosted. But all of that I can now do through the portal. My SQL Flexible, remember Flexible we like because it's this is replacing the old single server. This is now more VM based, which means I get access to more configuration options. I can have high availability. It supports availability zones. I can stop, start, burst wall VMs, all of that great stuff. And I have a universal geo restore. So instead of only being able to restore to the paired region, I can restore to any region. So it's opening up those abilities to do those restorations to something different from the paired region. So that is in preview. PostgreSQL Flexible now has some new minor versions, uh, 15.3, 14.8, 13.11, 12.15, 11.20. And you're just gonna get these. So as part of the monthly plan maintenance, it will automatically do those minor version upgrades and then this is a really cool capability. So Azure SQL Database now has the external REST endpoint invocation capability gone GA. So now within my, uh, my, my SQL commands, I can do an SP invoke external REST endpoint and call any endpoint. It could be an Azure function, could be a logic app, anything that has an endpoint, I can trigger it, get the responses back, and use it as part of whatever I'm doing in that SQL. So it's really nice to now have that integration with those external endpoints. And then miscellaneous, I talked about this before, cost management. So what cost management lets me do is set up on a daily, weekly, monthly basis, an export in CSV format to a storage account. But the challenge we had before is that storage account couldn't have a firewall configured on it. Well, now they've added support to have a firewall configured on the storage account. All I have to do is open it up to the Azure Trusted Platform Services, and then it can go ahead and do that export. And then finally, if you think of Azure Monitor, I have alert rules. And those alert rules can trigger from things like the activity log, from metrics, from Azure Monitor logs. Well, they also added support for those log alert types for the Azure Data Explorer, so another option. Well, now they've added in the ability from the Azure Resource Graph. So the Azure Resource Graph, remember, is that highly performant ability to query things on our control plane of Azure, the Azure Resource Manager. So I could now build an alert rule based around queries I run against the Azure Resource Graph and even join it with information in my Azure Monitor logs. So a really nice, powerful capability to drive alerts that I may want to perform. And that's it. Uh, as always, I hope that's really useful. Until next video, take care.